I'm Paul. And I'm Ming. And welcome to Skip the Rulebook, your fire extinguisher against an inferno of rules rescuing your new game. Today we'll be battling through the flames in Orphans and Ashes. In this game you play the heroic Kale or the dastardly Richard, each trying to make their way through the blazing orphanage to reach beleaguered orphans before the fire can claim them. As Kale, you'll be trying to rescue as many poor orphans as his chiselled muscular frame can hold, whilst Richard just feels it'd be a shame to let perfectly good innocent souls go to waste. Let's skip the rulebook. Orphans and Ashes is a game based on much loved webcomic looking for group. You'll be taking on the role of either elven hero Kale Anon or undead warlock Richard as they stumble across an orphanage that's going up in smoke. For Kale, this is his call to heroism. For Richard, however, an opportunity to fuel his dark spells. Not going to need this. Upon opening the box, you're going to be presented with a good number of miniatures. The first bag is a pile of orphans that you'll be competing over during the game. I have it on good authority that this game contains more plastic orphan miniatures than any other game, guaranteed. The blue and red characters are that of Kale and Richard respectively. There are a pair of these, as one of them will be used to be your character during the game, while the other is used to keep track of your score. The game also comes with a pair of dice to add an element of unpredictability to what is an already dangerous situation. The remaining plastic pieces are the fire tokens. These come in two different colours and have different roles during the game. The yellow tokens represent the fire that's engulfing the building. The red tokens are known as the foosh tokens and represent Richard's pyromantic ability that he can use to roast his victims. A large portion of the game will involve you exploring the burning orphanage in search of those trapped within. The entrance hall is your starting point for your heroic or murderous endeavour. The tiles are the rooms you'll be drawing and placing to create the unique layout for your orphanage. The door tokens identify your route to sweet freedom or a blocked path that could leave you trapped. Each of the two characters in the game has a series of abilities they can employ. The character cards act as your crib sheet so you can keep track of your possible actions. The last card out of the box is the scorecard and allows you to keep track of your progress against each other and against the indiscriminate flames. To begin you'll need to choose your character. This can either be done randomly by rolling the dice or you can simply choose which character you want to play. I suggest the more sinister of you play Richard. Next, take the scorecard and place it to one side of the play area. Each player should then take one of their character pawns and place it at the top of the scorecard. Orphans and Ashes is not simply a head-to-head -head game and there's a third party trying to win, the fire. You'll be competing against the fire as well as against each other and it's more than possible for both players to lose. Take one of the yellow fire tokens and place it alongside your character pawns at the top of the scorecard. Then we need to decide which player will be going first. Each player should take one of the die, and the player who rolls the highest will be the starting player. Now we need to select the rooms that will make up the orphanage. There are two types of room card. The named rooms, which are identified by a name at the top of the card, and the generic rooms. Randomly select seven of each of these Then shuffle them together to form our room deck. The remaining cards should then be placed back in the box. These will sadly not get to be an orphanage today. Place the entrance in the middle of the game area. While the first player will get to take the first turn, it's the second player that sets up the initial orphanage. Since I lost the roll off, I will draw four cards from the room deck one at a time and place them on the table matching them up with the entrance tile by connecting one of the doors on the tile with one of the doors on the entrance hall. If after placing a room tile, any of the doors match up with walls, they're considered blocked by wreckage. Place a blocked marker on this door. It's considered impassable during the game. Any connecting doors are considered to be open.
There are some rooms, such as the ice box, which act as dead ends. If you manage to draw four dead end cards, shuffle them back into the deck and draw four new cards. Otherwise, you're in for a pretty short game. Whenever you draw a new rune card, either during setup or while exploring, you must populate it with the orphans and fires found within. The person who draws that rune card gets to choose the placement of the fires and orphans. Let's start with this corridor. Each generic room will always have one fire and one orphan within it. You can place these tokens in any empty space within that room, but they cannot be placed in the same square. If you're playing Kale, it makes sense to place the orphans near the entrance to make it easier to rescue them. However, if you're playing Richard, it's a good idea to make it a bit more difficult. The named rooms are a little different. The numbers of fires and orphans you place in this room is indicated by the icons at the top of the card. For each fire symbol, place one fire token. And for each weird face symbol, place one orphan. So this dining room will have two fires and three orphans. With the orphanage built and populated, finish up by placing your two characters on the steps of the orphanage. Player one can now begin their first turn. Orphans and Ashes is a slightly asymmetric game, with each player having their own objectives and methods to win. Since I'm playing Kale, my job is to save as many orphans as I can. I do this by making my way through the orphanage and carrying them to safety. For each orphan I save, I score one point. Each player's turn is broken up into the action phase and the fire phase. During the action phase, you can complete three actions. There are a number of these to choose from, and they can be done multiple times and in any order. I'm going to begin my first turn by using my move action. To do this, I roll one of the dice. I can then move my character a number of squares equal to the result rolled. This can be horizontally or vertically, but not diagonally. Never diagonally! Since my job is to rescue orphans, it makes sense to move straight towards the closest one. It's worth mentioning that you can choose to break up your movement to perform another action. If you do this, simply continue your movement after you've completed the chosen action. Once I'm in the room, I'm going to try and make life a little bit safer by using my second action to put out a fire, or at least attempt to. When using the put out fire action, you again roll one of the dice. You then compare the result with the put out fire table to see whether you're successful. For each fire you put out, you're allowed to remove one of the fire tokens from the room you currently occupy. Since I rolled a 5, I can put out two fires. I start by taking this fire token out of the room and putting it back in the pile. Unfortunately, the put out fire action is limited to the room you're in, so I'm not going to be allowed to remove a second token. For my last action, I'm going to use one of Kale's special abilities. The with me action causes all orphans in my current room to attempt to move to my space. Kale then heroically picks them up. You do this by either balancing or hooking the orphans onto one of Kale's conveniently shaped arms. With that, my turn is over, and I now have to complete the fire phase. This is where the fire has a chance to spread and engulf the building. Simply roll one of the dice and consult the fire phase table. For each fire that spreads, you have to add one more yellow fire token to the board. In this case, my roll of a 5 means I will have to place two fire tokens. While it's the player whose turn it is that chooses the placement of these tokens, there are a number of rules that you have to follow. Firstly, the fire must be placed adjacent to an existing fire token. Again, this can be vertically or horizontally, but not diagonally. NEVER DIAGONALLY! The second rule says that if a fire can spread onto an orphan, it must. Apparently fire is a bit of a fan of tragedy. Based on these two rules, my first fire token will have to go here. If fire spreads onto an orphan, take one of the fire tokens and clip it to the bottom of the orphan miniature. Though the orphan is now going up by kindling, it takes two fire tokens to actually hurt them. I now have to place my second fire token. The next of fire's immutable rules says that it can only spread once per room. So I won't be adding a second fire token to our already pained orphan and instead have to place it in one of the other rooms. If fire cannot spread onto an orphan, then it must spread as close to one as it can, so my second fire token will be placed here. With the fire phase complete, the next player can begin their turn. While Kale and Richard may adventure together, Richard is blessed with a much more flexible morality than Kale. Richard's goal in Undeath is to be a powerful warlock, 
To do this, he needs an ample supply of souls to use as fuel. How convenient that he should come across this burning orphanage. While Kale scores points by rescuing the orphan pawns, Richard scores points by using his special abilities to incinerate them. As with Paul, I'm going to begin my turn by trying to move closer towards my quarry. Since the dining room has a large supply of orphans, that's where I'm headed. Unfortunately, the door is blocked by a fire token. I could try and avoid it, but I'm going to try and leap through in a decidedly awesome fashion. When you move through or land in a square containing a fire token, you must roll a die to see whether you actually catch fire. On a roll of two to six, you jump through safely. However, if you roll a one, your clothes catch fire and you are burned. Well nuts. If you do roll a one, you must take a fire token from the pile and add it to the bottom of your character pawn. Each character can take a number of burns equal to their hit points indicated on their character card. So while I may be on fire, it would take another three to kill me. Though I caught fire when entering the room, I can still finish the remainder of my move action. Since being on fire is generally considered to be a bad thing, I'm going to use my second action to pat myself down and put it out. When you use the stop, drop and roll action, you can remove one fire token from the bottom of your character pawn and place it back in the pile. For my last action, I'm going to try and score some points by being, well, a bit evil. Richard's Foosh ability is where he uses his fell magic to set his victims on fire. While Richard is definitely the bad guy, he doesn't really want Kale to know about it. Richard can only use his Foosh ability when he's out of line of sight of Kale. Simply draw an imaginary line from the centre of the square that Richard occupies to the centre of the square that Kale occupies. If that line is blocked by a wall, he's considered to be out of line of sight. Next, roll a die and consult the Foosh table on your character card to see how many Fooshes you pull off. For each Foosh, add a red fire token to one of the orphans in your current room. These red fire tokens can't be added to empty squares or to Kale. Since I've rolled a two, I will only get to add one red Foosh token. With my three actions complete, I now perform my fire phase. As before, roll a die and consult the fire table. It's important to note that while the red Foosh tokens look similar to the yellow fire tokens, they don't spread during the fire phase. In this case, I'll only get to spread one fire. As before, I must follow fire's immutable rules and put it next to an existing fire and spread it onto an orphan if possible, including one that's already on fire. Therefore, I'm going to add a second fire token to this orphan, which is already simmering from Paul's last turn. Since the orphan has now gained a second fire token, it's removed from the game and is, um, sleeping. Remove the orphan miniature and any attached fire tokens. This action means the fire has scored one point. Move the fire token along the scoreboard by one point. Both Paul and I are now losing the game to the fire. A large portion of Orphans and Ashes involves exploring the building to find the orphans and inevitably the fires inside. My first action this turn is going to be to move in an attempt to uncover some new rooms. I'm going to start by moving up to this door. Your character automatically opens doors and it doesn't use up one of your three actions. As soon as you're adjacent to a door, roll one die and consult the doors, rooms and exits table. A roll of one to four and you've found a new room. A five or a six and you've found an exit. Since I've rolled a one, I've uncovered a new room. I draw a new room card from the top of the deck and place it so that the doors connect up to the one that I'm going through. As with setup, any door that matches up to a wall should have a blocked door token placed on it. I now also need to spawn the orphans and the fires inside this room. Since this is a generic room, I place one of each. I can now continue my move by using my remaining points of movement to actually step into the room. Both Kale and Richard can readily move through and end their turn in squares occupied by both Orphans and the other player's character. While I could pick up this Orphan straight away and attempt to save him, I'm instead going to now try and beckon another Orphan to safety. For my second action I'm going to use the Guide ability. When you use Guide you roll one die. 
You may then move one orphan that many squares, provided that it begins and ends in line of sight. Since I rolled a 3, I'm now going to elect to try and move this orphan three spaces towards me. While orphans can move through squares that are occupied by other pawns, they can't end their turn in the same square as another orphan. Since there are now two orphans in the room, I'm going to use my With Me ability to end my turn. As before, I pick up the orphans and try and balance them on Kale's rather hench shoulders. While orphan Jenga may initially be quite easy, the more orphans you add, the harder it gets. If at any point you either drop or knock off an orphan, it's counted as having died and must be removed from the game. This also means that the fire scores one point for each orphan. Now for my fire phase. Since I rolled a 1, no fire is placed. The fire is just chilling for this turn. Richard's aim in the game has obviously made more difficult with Kale keeping a watch rely on him. I can't use my Fush ability as Kale is currently in line of sight. Luckily, the guide ability that Paul used last turn also has a secondary use. You can elect to use the guide ability to move another character's pawn instead of moving an orphan. To do this, you don't roll a die, but simply move the other character's pawn one space. They have to begin this movement, but don't have to end within your line of sight. With Kale now safely out of sight, I can use my Fouche in peace. As before, I roll a die and consult the Fouche table. Since I rolled a 6, I can place 3 Fouche tokens and have a chance to score some points. Since I can place more than one token, I can choose how to distribute them on the orphans within my room. As both orphans now have two Fouche tokens, they're removed from the game. And this means I score two points. I move my character pawn up two places on the scorecard. With my current room cleared of orphans, I'm going to go exploring. I move up to the door and roll to see if I draw a new room card. I then spawn the occupants. As this is a named room, I place a number of orphans equal to the face icons. And a number of fire tokens equal to the number of fire icons. I then complete my move action by stepping into the room. With my actions complete, I now perform my fire phase. A roll of six means I place three fires. The first of these will spread to this orphan, and the second will spread to this orphan. Since there are no more orphans that the fire can spread directly to, the fire must spread to the nearest orphan. These happen to currently be in the arms of Kale, so the fire spreads towards him. I need to try and get these orphans to safety, so moving is my highest priority. This rather measly roll means that I can't quite get to this door, but I can try and get to this one by diving through the fire. When I do this, I must roll to see whether Kale catches fire. While a 6 means I'm safely through, I do have an armful of orphans. Each one of them must roll to jump through the fire exactly the same as a character. While two of them have made it safely through with me, the last one wasn't so lucky. That roll of a 1 means that it's unfortunately caught fire. I must remove one of the orphans I currently got hooked on my character, add a fire token to the bottom of it, and place it in a legal space in the room I currently occupy. It's worth mentioning at this point that if you choose to guide a character into a fire, they must roll to see whether they catch fire in exactly the same way as if they'd chosen to move through it themselves. With that done, I now need to roll to see if I've discovered another room. A roll of a 5 means I've successfully found an exit. Take one of the green exit tokens and place it on the door, indicating that this is a route to freedom. If at any point an orphan is adjacent to this door, 
either because you guided or carried them there, then they've escaped to safety. Remove the orphans from the board, then award Kale one point for each orphan saved. In future turns, it's possible that you could go through a door, such as this one, that would lead to the same square as this exit. If that happens, you don't roll to find a new room. Instead, roll one die, on a one or a two, this door would be impassable, on a three to six, this door would also be an exit. While this turn didn't go quite to plan, my next task is clear. I need to rescue that currently burning orphan. Unfortunately, with me doesn't work on orphans that are currently on fire. Luckily, Kale has a second ability called You're Under My Protection. When you use this action, you remove all fire and foosh from orphans in the same room. For my final action, I'm going to go for a bit of a Hail Mary pass. I'm going to use my With Me ability to move this orphan towards me. Unfortunately, this will mean that he has to pass through this fire to do so. When passing through the fire, he's going to have to make a fire roll exactly the same as if he was a character. Okay, that was close, but a roll of a two means he's made it safely to me. Since he's now adjacent to an exit, he also escapes to safety. And I get one more point. And now I have to roll for my fire phase. That roll means I'm going to have to add one more fire and unfortunately remove either this orphan or this one. So I'm going to elect to remove this one. While I would love to foosh all three of these orphans in my turn, unfortunately Richard can't use his foosh ability on an orphan that's already on fire. For my first action this turn, I'm going to use Richard's second special ability, aptly titled, Hey, that was my kill. Again, I can't use this ability when Richard is within line of sight of Kale. As he isn't, I can swap all the yellow fire tokens on one orphan for a foosh token. I'll now continue my reign of terror with another foosh. Well, a roll of one means that my foosh has failed and sadly I can't place any more tokens. I'm going to try again. A roll of five will get me two foosh tokens to distribute. I'm going to use my first to finish off this chap in the corner, so he's removed from the game and I get a point. I'm going to place my second one on this orphan. I then end my turn with the fire phase. The game continues like this with each player taking turns until one of three things happens to end the game. Firstly, once all rooms have been placed and all orphans are either rescued or roasted, the game's over. The second possibility is that through placement of dead end rooms, such as the infirmary, or successfully rolling exits, there's nowhere left to place a new room, in which case the game's over. If the game ends in either of these two ways, the player or fire with the most points wins. The third and final possibility is that a player's character is reduced to zero hit points. If that happens, that player is out and the other player wins by default. They may sound like a lot to this game, but once you've gotten started, you'll pick it up reasonably quickly. There are a few points that do bear reiteration because they're not immediately apparent. Fire tokens indicate that something is on fire. While fire tokens on characters and orphans do indicate damage, they are still invariably fire. If you pass through or land on a square that contains a burning orphan or character, you must roll to see whether you catch fire, in exactly the same way as if you'd moved through a square that just had a fire token on it. Additionally, if someone other than Richard moves through a square with a foosh, they must roll to catch fire in the same way, but with a red token instead. Kale, while decidedly heroic, is not without his limitations. He cannot pick up an orphan if he himself is already on fire. He must first stop, drop and roll. If Kale was to catch fire while he was holding an armful of orphans, he automatically drops them. Each of these orphans then has a fire token placed on them, and they are placed in a legal space in the current room. It's also possible during the fire phase for fire to spread to characters in the same way that it spreads to orphans, while still following fire's immutable rules. If fire were to spread to Kale while he was holding an armful of orphans, he automatically drops them as we mentioned before. Orphans and Ashes is a lot of fun and has some very interesting mechanics. It also has a very satisfyingly tactile quality with, among other things, the cool stackable fire tokens. 
The fact that a lot of the game revolves around the cat and mouse chase between Kale and Richard, as well as no small amount of deliberately screwing each other over, leads to some really hilarious moments during the game. Most notably in our games, those where Richard deliberately guides Kale carrying an armful of orphans into the fire. That's it from us at Skip the Rulebook. If you found this video useful, please hit like. If you want to hear more from Skip the Rulebook, press subscribe. You can also find out more about us on Facebook, Twitter, and at skiptherulebook.com. Keep your eyes out for a Just Play video to watch us play this game from start to finish. Join us next time for your chance to jump into that new board game without having to do any tedious rule reading. See you later. Never diagonally! <laughs> it's not going to be a good day. Quickly. Fantastic! <laughs> Each trying to wait their mate. Ma Upon opening the box, you're going to find quite a large amount of orphans. No, you're not, for God's sake. <laughs> it's not the only thing. Just a box full of orphans. <laughs> Mushroom, JK, fire. Each cat. Each, <laughs> each character. How's our bad? Bad, bad, bad.